Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, after such an impressive talk by Dr. Bakshi, I feel a little dwarfed, but uh, I'll try to uh, make it as uh, understandable to the audience as possible. Well, in the beginning, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Bajaj uh, because uh, he thought of a, such an important uh, topic. We keep on talking, at least in hepatology, uh, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, causes of cirrhosis, but he's picked up a topic which actually is a problem for all of us and by uh, uh, all hepatologists and uh, otherwise as well. Well, uh, alcohol, as you know, is the most frequent and socially acceptable hepatotoxin. There's no party that is successful without alcohol. There's no marriage where if alcohol is not served, it would be well taken. So it's become a socially acceptable hepatotoxin. And it affects the liver, depending on the dose and the duration. But you need to remember, since I see a lot of undergraduates, if one is a heavy drinker, there is a 90 to 100 percent chance of developing fatty liver. There is a 10 to 35 percent chance of developing alcoholic hepatitis, about which I'll discuss with you a little later. And 8 to 20 percent of these people ultimately develop cirrhosis liver. And this cirrhosis is usually micronodular, except when the patient has abstained from alcohol for a long time. Uh, Dr. Bakshi has already told you about the alcohol content of beverages and what we usually use as a standard to tell uh, how much of alcohol is harmful. 10 grams of alcohol is present in 30 ml of whiskey, 120 ml of wine and 360 ml of beer. Why is it that all people who take alcohol do not develop liver disease? One thing you need to realize that uh, the subset which usually gets affected with liver disease is the one who has a low educational level, low income, unemployed, job alienation, job stresses, and low job satisfaction. Although there are many others, uh, uh, affluent people who also get affected, but most of the people affected in clinical practice belong to this group. Many years ago, rationing and prohibition uh, done in the European countries way back in the 50s or 60s or when the cost of alcohol was increased brought about a change in the incidence of liver disease during that time. Unfortunately, what was practiced in Haryana some time back, uh, the alcohol incidence did not come down significantly in spite of prohibition and that was through the use of illicit liquor. But one thing uh, which is important to realize is drinks outside the meal time increases the chances of liver disease. The most important factor which brings about changes in the liver is the quantity of alcohol that is taken by an individual and the safe limit would be for males well below 60 grams per day and for females well below 20 grams per day and if this amount is taken more than that for 10 years there are chances that an individual would develop liver disease but wine tends to uh, lower all the causes of mortality and hence it is slightly hepatoprotective although one cannot give that liberty to have it's also been seen that Indians are more affected with liver disease as compared to the other groups. And this has been highlighted from studies in UK where the Indians and the Europeans drinking the same amount of alcohol tend to develop cirrhosis more often. It's also seen that uh, uh, we did some studies in Chandigarh where uh, the illicit liquor was found to have more of trace metals, more amount of alcohol as compared to what I just mentioned whiskey having 40% alcohol, the Indian made foreign liquor not being standardized had values as high as 60% with a very significant amount of lead, 
arsenic uh, as the trace metals. There could be some reason for genetic polymorphism and comorbidities responsible for increased prevalence or the incidence of liver disease in the Indians who are staying abroad. Women are more prone to develop liver disease uh, if they drink and as I had mentioned the limit of serogenic dose for women was less than 20 grams. Anyone drinking more than 20 grams more likely to develop liver disease and the reason being it is said that alcohol once it is taken gets metabolized in the gastric mucosa by alcohol dehydrogenase and this is present more in females so acetaldehyde is present is uh, the levels of acetaldehyde are much more higher in women. Secondly it's also said that uh, endotoxemia is more uh, it happens more often in women because of the leaky junctions within the intestine of the mucosal membrane. It has always been thought that malnutrition is uh, a significant factor for uh, development of uh, liver disease in an alcoholic. Even obesity has been found to increase the risk of uh, liver disease. In clinical practice, if you take 100 patients of cirrhosis coming to you, at least in Chandigarh, majority of them have cirrhosis because of alcohol, followed by hepatitis C. In other parts of the country, it is hepatitis B which is more prevalent. But in Punjab and Haryana, obesity forms the third important cause of cirrhosis liver. And when alcohol and obesity, both of which are common in uh, those two states, the chances of developing liver disease becomes much more higher almost five to six times. And this is because of increased hepatic insulin resistance in obese individuals and increased uh, tumor necrosis factor. Uh, these patients, uh, the malnourished individuals have vitamin A depletion and depletion of vitamin A within the hepatocytes activates the stellate cells which you know is important for the formation of fibrosis. With decrease in vitamin E because of malnutrition there is increased membrane lipid peroxidation which again is an important reason in the pathogenesis for liver disease. Co-infections with hepatitis C and hepatitis B also is more common in alcoholics because of their high risk behavior and whenever these hepatotropic viruses are combined with the insult because of alcohol to the liver, it produces synergistic liver injury. Hence these individuals develop liver disease at a younger age, more likely to develop hepatocellular carcinoma and in India almost 30% of alcoholics coming with liver disease have associated hepatitis C infection. Iron overload also is a factor which increases the chances of liver disease in alcoholics and genetic factors are also being considered to be important reason for development of liver disease because as I said the toxin is acetaldehyde so metabolism of alcohol into acetaldehyde is important. Faster the metabolism into acetaldehyde and slower the metabolism of acetaldehyde into acetates, these are the individuals who are likely to get liver disease. And this is by the two enzymes, alcohol dehydrogenase 3 to 1 and uh, acetaldehyde dehydrogenase uh, ALDH2 and 2. So what basically is the pathogenesis of liver disease in an alcoholic? It is an interaction between the metabolism of alcohol, the inflammatory response and the immune response. So all these three are very essential for development of liver disease. And as I said, alcohol dehydrogenase pathway increases the levels of acetaldehyde in the body. It directly damages the hepatocytes by forming acetaldehyde adducts and which becomes immunogen immunogenic and antibodies are formed. There is also increased expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines. 
there's another pathway which metabolizes alcohol and that is by way of cytochrome P450 to E1 which increases the development of reactive oxygen species important for damaging the hepatocytic membrane and the mitochondria. Polymorphisms in the uh, pro-inflammatory cytokine IL-10 uh, also tends to get affected. There is down regulation of TNF alpha and type 1 collagen <coughs> and there is development of autoantigens which leads to damage of the hepatocytes. There is also indirect hepatocyte injury by way of cytokines of the Kupffer cells and increased lipid peroxidation activates the, hepatocyte, uh, the hepatic stellate cells. So how does alcohol affect the liver? The different spectrum that we clinically see is alcoholic steatosis which is a relatively benign condition but majority of the individuals do develop steatosis of fatty liver. The other important group is alcoholic hepatitis which would develop in another small percentage of cases where there are abnormalities in the liver enzymes the patient becomes jaundiced and this could be either mild or severe. Mild has a relatively good prognosis, severe has a very bad prognosis. Some of these patients go on to develop cirrhosis which may be compensated when there are no symptoms to suggest cirrhosis or decompensated when they develop jaundice, ascites and pedal edema. Then there is a new term known as acute and chronic liver failure. This has been in vogue for the last 4-5 years and we used to see these group of patients very often till, uh, till we realize that this is a separate group of patients who have high mortality and you need to do a liver transplant in these cases if there is no reversibility of liver disease with therapy. So you define acute on chronic liver failure as any person who has been drinking alcohol develops jaundice and develops ascites within four weeks. <coughs> within four weeks of development of uh, jaundice. Uh, patients of alcoholic liver disease also are more prone to develop HCC. Although alcoholic hepatitis is acute, when you do a biopsy in these patients, 50% of them have established cirrhosis. And one should always suspect cirrhosis if even after abstinence of alcohol, patient still is symptomatic. This again is the statistics that we've had uh, last year of patients at PGI where of the 478 cirrhotics, alcohol constituted 58% of the, uh, the uh, incidents. HCV was 20%, HBV 12% and cryptogenic or in other words NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis was 15%. And this is increasing because of increased consumption of junk food and more obese individuals. When we looked at our hepatocellular carcinoma data, again almost 13% the cryptogenic group had uh, HCC because of uh, obesity and 14% had because of alcohol and co-infection with hepatitis B and C again was an important cause of HCC. <coughs> this is our own publication of the acute precipitants in acute and chronic liver failure where we found that quite a significant proportion of patients had ACLF or acute and chronic liver failure because of alcohol where alcohol was the acute precipitant it could be hepatitis B, C, E over an underlying chronic liver disease which again was alcohol to be most common in the Indian group of patients at least in Punjab. So how do you diagnose a patient with a liver disease because of alcohol? Certainly there should be it should be in the context of significant alcohol data, there should be supporting laboratory data 
and uh, one should from a psychologist point of view look at the uh, whether alcohol affects the daily functioning of these patients but an alcoholic cirrhotic is different from another cirrhotic by way of increased chances of parotid enlargement more spiders they have dupuytren's contracture and patients with alcoholic hepatitis along with cirrhosis would have a bruy over the liver the other causes of bruy over the liver is hepatocellular carcinoma so you have only two conditions which produce a bruy or a murmur over the liver one is hepatocellular carcinoma and the other is alcoholic liver disease or hepatitis uh, these patients are also prone to have other dysfunctions like cardiomyopathy sarcopenia pancreatic dysfunction and neurotoxicity when you look at the laboratory abnormalities the history being significant for alcohol the transaminases that is the sgot and sgpt is not as high as what you would expect in viral hepatitis where it is in thousands in alcoholic liver disease it would be 2 to 6 times raised above the upper limit of normal and if the value of sgot or ast is more than 500 think of another etiology and if of alt or sgpt is more than 200 again think of another etiology the ast alt ratio is another way of diagnosing these patients the ratio in the garden variety of hepatitis alt is always more than ast so the ratio is less than 1 but in patients with alcoholic liver disease especially alcoholic hepatitis the ratio is more than 2 ast is always higher than alt and if the patient has evidence of cirrhosis the ratio is more than 3 so it it's a guide for you to uh, think in terms of uh, alcohol as an etiology they have high wbc count macrocytic anemia hyperglycemia hypertriglyceridemia and hyperuricemia liver biopsy is rarely indicated except you if you want to have confirmation or to know the severity of liver damage and there are some specific features like mallory highland bodies neutrophilic infiltration uh, fat macrovesicular fat and micronodular cirrhosis with creeping fibrosis around the hepatocytes imaging is not of much help except you get a pseudo parallel channel sign in patients with alcoholic hepatitis on an ultrasound ultrasound in biliary obstruction tends to produce dilatation of the biliary radicals which are not normally seen you only see the portal vessels but in alcoholic hepatitis there is no biliary obstruction the hepatic artery tends to get dilated and that is how you get a parallel channel sign and these are some of the pathological findings of steatosis cirrhosis and uh, fibrosis and hepatocellular carcinoma in an alcoholic prognosis is extremely good in patients with fatty liver disease uh, survival is 50 to 75 percent at four to five years in a patient with alcoholic hepatitis and cirrhosis depending on the hepatitis if it is mild or severe and in acute on chronic liver failure 30 to 50 percent die at three months <clears throat> this again is uh, a study from our own institute which we published some time back where we showed that if one has to prognosticate in patients with acute and chronic liver failure the apache 2 score and sofa score which are important for organ function uh, are the most important parameters to prognosticate in these patients and go ahead with a liver transplantation if the patient doesn't improve within a specified period of time but there are other prognostic models which tell you uh, how aggressive the treatment should be done especially in the group of alcoholic hepatitis because alcoholic hepatitis doesn't give you much time to uh, to uh, treat if the patient responds within a week two weeks or even three weeks with medical therapy it's fine but if the patient doesn't respond go ahead with the liver transplant otherwise mortality is very high but one way of prognosticating is the madri discriminant function which is 
uh, which is a product of 4.6 multiplied by prothrombin time of the patient minus the control and serum bilirubin. And if the value is more than 32, mortality is high and these patients need aggressive therapy. MELD is the another uh, score which we use in liver transplant. All cirrhotics cannot be taken up for a transplant. So if the MELD score goes beyond 15, the patient becomes a candidate for a liver transplant. The full form is the, the uh, Mayo end stage liver disease score, which uh, was uh, uh, incidentally brought about by uh, Dr. Hepatologist from PGI, Patrick Kamath, almost 10 to 15 years ago and is the standard for uh, any liver related uh, uh, prognostic mod models. Then you have the Glasgow alcoholic hepatitis score which uh, was produced from uh, Glasgow, UK and that also prognosticates uh, uh, whether this patient needs a very aggressive therapy or just an ordinary therapy. And there are dynamic models which say that if the MELD does not improve uh, over a period of one week by two scores, patient should be taken up for transplant. So abstinence is absolutely important in these patients. Most of them improve if they have fatty liver within three months. Patients with mild alcoholic hepatitis who don't have a raise in bilirubin also improve with abstinence. But the major problem with these patients is recidivism. They go back to alcohol and this is seen in about 60 to 80 percent of patients. And to prevent that you have naltrioxone, acamprosate, which has already been alluded to by Professor Chadda. But baclofen, which is considered to be very safe in patients with liver disease, is considered to be a good drug which prevents a uh, patient relapsing into uh, uh, drinking alcohol again. Since obesity is common in such patients, lifestyle modifications like a little bit of exercise and better nutrition is important initially for such patients. Again, this uh, study shows that baclofen significantly improves the chances of recidivism in these patients, in turn improves survival to a little extent. Nutrition is very important in such patients since we know that malnutrition is common and assessment of malnutrition is difficult. These patients have ascites, so the weight is more and uh, getting into BMI is uh, problematic. They have low albumin levels in any case. Anthropometry is not important because in any case they have sarcopenia. So the usual way of assessing uh, malnutrition doesn't hold true in patients with liver disease. The best indicator is creatinine height index considered in such patients. And aggressive uh, nutrition is important because studies have shown that hepatic regeneration and reversal of sarcopenia happens uh, if a good nutrition with a protein of more than 1.5 grams per kilogram of body weight and calories more than 30 kilocalories per kilogram of body weight improves the chances of the prognosis in such patients. Uh, if these patients are not able to take voluntarily orally, then small bore feeding tube also can be uh, given to such patients. Another recent uh, recommendation is these patients should be given a nighttime snack, say around 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock, because uh, again studies have shown that uh, uh, if they are given uh, the total amount of calories breaking into three to four, every three to four hours, the chances of recovery is higher. Liberal multivitamins should be given and branch chain amino acids if there is uh, overt hepatic encephalopathy since it is expensive. Steroids have been extensively studied because it is anti-inflammatory and uh, it is immunosuppressive, has an antifibrotic effect. But a large number of trials and meta-analysis have shown that steroids are effective only in a select group of patients who have severe alcoholic hepatitis and do not have uh,
and do not have uh, any evidence of bleed, hepatorenal syndrome and infection. In our own clinical practice, steroids tend to produce infection in these patients who are already immunosuppressed and we haven't had very good uh, responses to steroids in patients with alcoholic hepatitis. There is a Lille score where uh, you can give a chance one week trial of steroids to these patients and if there is a fall in bilirubin, the Lille score takes into account age, bilirubin, serum creatinine, albumin, and prothrombin time and if in, if in seven days you are not able to bring down the bilirubin then the patient is likely to be a non-responder and becomes an indication for liver transplant. People have tried anti-cytokine therapy, decrease somehow the levels of tumor necrosis factor, interleukin 1, 6 and 8 by using pentoxifilin. Initial studies had shown good results but meta-analysis of a number of studies now have shown that it also doesn't work very much with the type of patients that come to us who have a very high MADRI score and who are in extreme severe alcoholic uh, hepatitis. The only advantage of pentoxifilin is it prevents the development of hepatorenal syndrome or renal failure in such patients. People have tried infleximab, etanercept, which are both anti-TNFs, antioxidants, colchicin, propyl, uracil, and polyenyl phosphatidylcholine but they have not shown to be very effective in these patients. And some new potential uh, therapeutic options are there in the horizon, but have yet to prove the test of time. Liver transplantation in these patients has always been very controversial because uh, with the shortage of liver in the, the especially the cadaveric group, uh, one tends to feel that this is a self-inflicted disease and hence these individuals are not uh, uh, worthy of uh, getting the liver transplant. But there, uh, 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 there are uh, uh, the uh, people who believe that uh, uh, in that way the self-inflicted diseases are hepatitis C also which happens in intravenous drug abusers, those who haven't had blood transfusions properly. So you should not give uh, uh, liver transplant to them as well. So, so as of now, liver transplantation in alcoholics is usually done if there is total abstinence for a period of three to six months. Otherwise, as I said, recidivism or relapse into alcohol happens and hence it is given to these patients if they are abstinent for six months. And results are supposed to be better in uh, alcoholics because the chances of rejection, graft failure and need for retransplantation is less common. So this is another study where uh, they say that if the patient doesn't improve, this was published two years ago, if the patient doesn't improve uh, in two weeks time, a patient with severe alcoholic hepatitis with a MADRI score of more than 100, patient should be taken up for a transplant. Well, that's all which uh, uh, the organ which alcohol tends to affect mainly. But there's another organ in the GI tract, pancreas, which also gets affected in these patients. And alcoholic pancreatitis forms almost one third of the total patients with chronic pancreatitis that come to our uh, units and this was published way back in 2008. The commonest reason being uh, idiopathic for chronic pancreatitis, although we all know that acute pancreatitis is mostly because of gallstone disease. And the threshold for development of alcoholic pancreatitis is not as well studied as in alcoholic liver disease, but it is said that more than 150 grams of alcohol per day for more than five years is a relative good threshold for development of alcoholic pancreatitis. But only three to 15 person develop it, so there must be some cofactors. But patients with the uh, chronic pancreatitis because of alcohol usually present with recurrent abdominal pain, which is unrelated to food and about less than 10% of them 
do not present with pain, but with exocrine and endocrine deficiency. Exocrine deficiency is by way of steatoria and endocrine insufficiency because of development of diabetes. But this pain over a period of 10 years, patients keep on coming to you with repeated pain, but this pain gradually gets burnt out over a period of 10 years. As in alcoholic liver disease, even pancreatic functional changes tend to occur in spite of cessation of alcohol. And studies have shown that exocrine insufficiency occurs in those who have not had in the beginning after about 13 years of presentation, first episode of uh, painful chronic pancreatitis, endocrine insufficiency in one third in about 20 years time and pancreatic uh, calcification that you see on uh, plain x-ray abdomen occurs after a period of eight to nine years. Now, why is it that uh, some patients of alcohol, increased alcohol consumption develop liver disease, the other group develops pancreatitis, was uh, clearly studied in an autopsy data where majority of patients with alcoholic liver disease had subclinical uh, chronic pancreatitis and uh, about 18 percent of cirrhotics had evidence of alcoholic pancreatitis which was partly symptomatic. Where, whereas when you took all patients with alcoholic pancreatitis, 30 percent of them had silent alcoholic cirrhosis. And whenever a patient with alcoholic uh, of alcohol consumption comes to you with severe pain abdomen and if you do a biopsy for any reason following uh, surgery for uh, uh, pancreatic necrosis, there is always evidence of chronicity. Genetic factors are not very important as compared to the liver disease. So there is no role of uh, alcohol dehydrogenase and SIP gene polymorphisms. Smoking in these patients is more likely to develop chronic pancreatitis and pancreatic cancer. Diet high in fat and protein and deficiency in antioxidants again is a predisposer for chronic pancreatitis. And here again possibly the culprit is acetaldehyde but it has not been well studied. And abstinence does not halt the progression of endocrinal and exocrinal insufficiency but decreases the rate of progression of both pancreatitis as well as these insufficiencies. So friends, in conclusion, I would say that alcohol mainly affects the liver, but also tends to affect the pancreas. It has little effect on the gastrointestinal tract, except in the form of erosive bleedings. But the spectrum, as I said, of alcoholic liver disease is a fatty liver, alcoholic hepatitis, cirrhosis, and acute on chronic liver failure, and HCC. Presentation of acute on chronic liver failure needs to be recognized by, uh, uh, by everyone, all the clinicians, and you can have a score of a fascia 2, which tells you the chances of mortality. One needs to manage the complications of such patients. They are more prone to develop infections. Nutrition is important. Pentoxifilin and corticosteroids have a doubtful role, except in a few those who do not have any evidence of infection or those who have a Lilly score of uh, positivity where uh, they respond to steroids and liver transplantation is the ultimate answer for patients with alcoholic liver disease who do not respond to medical therapy. Thank you all for your patient hearing. I'll be happy to to any of your queries. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, uh, the most of the liver diseases now are being attributed to endotoxemia through the gut. And these leaks have been found to be more often in females as compared to males. Although this is, the reason is not very clear. This is just a recent thought where they have uh, studied the endotoxin levels in the portal vessel and they found the levels to be higher in females. Secondly, as far as women are concerned, he said alcoholics, in them the you know, immunological uh, factor was uh, seen. 
BID was more common. So I wonder if same in hepatitis also. Is it the comorbid infection or is it because it reduces their immunity? Because uh, it was founded in <coughs> hepatitis. So if we look at this factor, maybe our treatment modality said, will it help? Firstly, I, I don't have an answer to this. If you look in clinical practice, we still get very few women with uh, alcoholic liver disease. And this gender-specific differentiation in uh, liver disease because of alcohol has not been adequately studied. Uh, uh, women and men, the immunity, we don't expect it to be different in either of them. So I don't see much reason for immunity being uh, an important factor in differentiating the genders. But what has been studied is the presence of alcohol dehydrogenase to be, to be uh, more in females in the stomach, which breaks down alcohol into acetaldehyde and increased levels in them. Can I ask the third question? The third question is that you did such a wonderful study uh, as far as the, uh, from PGI about the alcohol uh, hepatitis and you said 58 percent that's right what i am interested to know the people who came uh, what group or stata sometimes we say it is poverty education second because it is a rich indian data was it more the affluent was it more the rural that is one question number two what was the type of the drink that they took was it the homemade drink? Was it the Indian made? Was it the foreign made? Third, was it that the regular? Because quite often, uh, I think there is, a, I don't know whether there is any politician sitting. If it is not sitting, you see in them alcohol abundant, cirrhosis abundant. So I just want to know the richness of this data because I was very happy to see the Indian data. Yeah, ma'am, you would realize that uh, Punjab is a little different yes. from uh, other yeah. states, yeah. Yeah. and that's a rich state. But when we look at the type of alcoholics that come to us, they are rich farmers mm. who have easy accessible to alcohol. The youngsters, the youngest patient that we've seen is about 20 years old. Wow. 20 to 30 years group is the one that takes Indian-made foreign liquor which has more of, uh, uh, not IMFL, the illicit liquor, illicit. which has more amount of alcohol. We analyzed the amount of alcohol and it turned out to be 60%. So there's no standardization in that. And uh, they had more amount of trace metals. Arsenic and lead was more common in such patients. So the standard teaching is 10 years and more of a serogenic dose leads to liver disease. In the illicit liquor, even five years is good enough. But uh, this is a very important study, and you must give the recommendation to the ministry. Though I'm sure, as far as the business people are concerned, they won't <coughs> like it. In the sense that the alcohol contained arsenic. When I was a student, a lot of these materials were used as a body patient, and patient came with paralysis. So. Our liquors, we say we make good liquors, you know, and I know like Kingfisher of India, uh, beer and others are very good. So the metals, which are very bad, number one. Number two, the, the, the quantity. This, this would hold true for illicit liquors. Uh, I'm just, talking of illicit, the, which is very not, common not, in uh, India. Uh, that's right, that's yeah. right. So which is very common in India, means if we cannot ban whatever we can, we say, Please standardize it. That's Please right. look at it. The amount of harm. And to come on the media, because these people now, media is influencing the poor. Because they are seeing the TV so much, you know. Right, right. Very important, uh, I would say, the data. Excellent. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I think we can conclude session at this stage. Excuse me, sir. Uh, Excuse me, sir. Yes. Sir, I have one question. Sir, what is the role of a uh, spin? What is the role of a SPINK1 gene in our own body? SPINK1 gene is uh, important as far as idiopathic chronic pancreatitis is concerned, but that has been adequately studied in alcoholic pancreatitis. It doesn't hold much significance. 
in idiopathic where you don't have any etiology earlier on tropical pancreatitis used to be more often seen in india that incidentally is going down but there still is a group of where you don't have any etiology either of hypertriglyceridemia or uh, or uh, the double uh, duct sign uh, the annular pancreas hereditary pancreatitis sphinx uh, one gene is important for the idiopathic group sir there is no ph- any physiological function in our body i don't know what physiological function how it works that i am not too sure thank you sir thank you thank you sir